But I think the most important thing of super diversity, of the concept of super diversity, which is actually a lens of looking at society, not a theory, is that we have uh, the situation that lots of people have make use of modern technologies, social networks, and that they communicate with people in other parts of the world, uh, their friends, their relations, uh, so they're permanently not in one place, but they're in different places. And we have loads of uh, young refugees whose language repertoires sort of are like a map of the of the route that they have taken from Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq to Austria, and their situation. Because there's one guy who had uh, Somali in his repertoire, because he spent three months in Dreiskirchen, the refugee center, and he had friends from Somalia, so he learned Somali. And all these kids have like uh, seven or eight languages in their repertoires. It's is fascinating. Metrolingualism is a concept that uh, an Australian uh, linguist has proposed. Uh, and this, this is actually using languages, many languages, different languages to communicate. So that actually sort of destroys the concept of a language is a language, is an entity that you can count, that has borders and that has a beginning and an end and is complete, but repertoires mean that it, I use some Pashto words, some uh, Arabic words, some Kurdish words, some German words, some English words, some Somali words to communicate with other people. So metrolingualism actually is sort of the mingling and uh, merging of languages. Multilingual classrooms are a gift. We, we've been working on multilingual classrooms quite a long time now, last six, seven years, devising activities, making use of um, multilingualism in classrooms. And what we found is that it's not only making use of languages that probably the teachers don't know, it's also a question of, of power and tolerance. And I think the basic thing about multilingualism is that it opens up uh, a wide range of, of uh, resources. But what we have to do is we have to make use of the resources. For example, if a, if a child speaks Pashto and is able to compare Pashto grammar to German grammar, not only is this child at the moment of making use and presenting that to the rest of the class, the expert, but also it might, and it will, and it certainly does, uh, make it easier to understand the German grammar and to make a, a comparison. We think we can prove, and there's other people who have proved that, that this actually helps kids to learn other languages. And especially kids uh, the, between the ages of 6 and 10 are curious, they want to learn languages. We need to take this uh, uh, interest in languages and we need to make use of these resources and then it's fun and then teachers can learn on the job and multi metrolingualism comes in here as well so to, 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 to look at errors and, and, and mistakes with a curious perspective with an ethnographic perspective just to see what's there and try to find out why it's there I think the idea of the separate German as a second or probably as a foreign language in this case for kids is totally misleaded. Uh, it's based on two wrong assumptions. One is that language learning takes place when language teaching happens. And I think we as teachers have to accept that language learning takes place when teaching is not there. A lot of language learning takes place when kids communicate with their peers. So if we have German-only classes for certain groups of kids, then we cut this uh, possibility off. Uh, the second assumption is that only when you understand German very well, you can understand what go it's going on in school, which I think is also wrong because this uh, is only true for very much language-based content. And it's counter as, as a counter-integration measure. If we aim at integration, then we have to do integration. And one part of integration is integrated classrooms.